Hello everyone, my name is Mike and welcome back to another reaction video. So apologies for the slight delay in uploads, so work should be starting up again uh, soon so I've just been trying to get on top of that. Um, however said that while schools are reopening and I'll be going back into work in the schools, um, I hope to continue doing this and uh, taking this forward because I've really enjoyed it. Uh, some of the response has been absolutely magnificent and I thank you so much for that. Uh, particularly the last two videos, the the words and the comments, the They've they've been really nice, um, basically, and I weren't expecting that. Um, and so, thank you, every one of you who uh, watches or comments or likes or just 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 being here. And so, I, I thank you for that. Um, and as a, an addition to that, some people have messaged me asking if they could support the channel in some way. And so, I have set up a Patreon um, if you decide to do so. Um, but it, it's by no means uh, demanded or or warranted. It's just only if you would like to support me financially, support the channel, like the things that I do and want to see more, then uh, it's not necessary, but it'd be very gracious if you could. Um, but yeah, again, as I said, it, it's not necessary, it's not demanded of, it's just only if you would like to, then um, I'd be very, <laughs> very, very thankful if you decided to um, give this guy who rambles in his kitchen about history um, a little bit of extra money. but. Is, is not warranted at all because I just love doing this and I love engaging with you in the comments um, and I love the idea that these videos might enable you to learn a little bit more or foster a little bit more um, excitement and um, imagination about maybe some events that you weren't necessarily familiar of. And so getting into this I was going to go straight into the Cold War oversimplified videos um, but just due to the nature of how long they are and I think they would be long videos, you know, long rambling ones similar to the Russian Revolution where um, clocking up 50 minutes or so if I were to talk about them. Uh, just because I'm pressed for time at the minute I would like to do the mini war series, mini war series starting with the Falkland Islands. Um, I don't know how big of a conflict that is uh, known globally. I don't know if it's something that's just really reserved for people in Britain and Argentina. Um, and the Falkland Islands themselves, or whether it's known uh, wider afield, but essentially uh, during the 1980s, uh, Argentine uh, Junta government sought to win popular appeal basically by invading the Falkland Islands, and we'll be looking into getting that. Um, I'm fascinated by the Falkland Islands, it's a war that you know, I, I wasn't born when it happened, but it's still one that's kind of still resonance with uh, a lot of people today. It was, uh, you know, it, the my, like my parents' generation or a lot of people who are around today was around when that was uh, going on and so there's a lot of common memory in there and speaking of that there was a wonderful book called The Forgotten Voices of the Falklands um, that I actually coincidentally only finished reading not too long ago. Uh, I can't remember the author's name at the moment but I will link the title of the book and the author in the description if you would like to check that out and it's a book that's not conventional, it's constructed entirely off of memoirs, reports, diary entries from British, Argentine and uh, war correspondents and Falkland Islanders who are part of the conflict. Um, so detailing all the way up from the initial invasion uh, by the Argentines um, to the occupation of the islands from the perspective of both the Argentines uh, and the civilians who are there and then obviously the British response, so detailing everything from lowly, um, low rank seamen and uh, marines and uh, air force personnel all the way up to some very poignant uh, diaries and memoirs from um, the higher echelons of the fleet and war correspondents when they're talking as you know, people, not as journalists, it's uh, it's quite revealing what they actually think and what they didn't hear. Obviously, you can't necessarily trust all of those historical sources, but to get an idea, and, and a particularly a balanced idea, of what the conflict was like for both British and Argentine uh, soldiers there, then I, I would extremely recommend it, and I will link it in the description later. But that's enough rambling from me. Um, let's just get straight into the video, because that's all, <laughs> that's what you'll want to see anyway. Um, but yeah. Hi English Mariner John Strong. Hi Anthony Carey, 5th Viscount of Falkland. I would very much like for you to go to Chile and locate the wreck of a Spanish treasure ship for me. Okay. Hey, I found some islands. Yeah. 
The English were probably not the first to discover the Falklands, but they were the first to write it down. They found it to be cold, wet, and miserable. Just like, just like home. So they established <laughs> the colony in 1765, uh. unaware that the French had also discovered the islands and done the same a year earlier. And for a while, the two were unaware of each other's existence, until presumably there was an awkward moment where they ran into each other. Then the Spanish showed up and told the French that a couple hundred years earlier, the Pope drew a line on a map and said, all of this belongs to Portugal and all of this belongs to Spain. Yeah, so that was happening back kind of as well, because remember Portugal, a lot of people don't uh, seem to recognize or uh, know that Portugal was a major colonizing power. They were a, they were one of the nations that was very extremely apt at um, exploring and I said the Portuguese colonial empire was certainly a thing. Um, they, they was almost like the pioneers of it, really. Um, and yeah, so this is the the line that was drawn. I can't remember the pope who uh, drew it, but essentially everything to the east of that belonged to Portugal, and everything to the west of that belonged to Spain, uh, partic in the New World. Um, and so that's why in places like Brazil they speak Portuguese, whereas in lots of other uh, South America they speak Spanish. Um, and, and that comes all the way back to, to this line, is why... Um, I, as I said I'm showing up my geography knowledge here but I don't know if Brazil is the only South American country that speaks Portuguese um, but I know certainly it does when a lot of other South American countries um, speak Spanish obviously if there is another South American country that does speak Portuguese then please let me know because um, at the moment I'm showing up my uh, lack of geography knowledge at the minute <laughs> Yeah. and that the island was in Spain's territory and they would like the French to hand over their settlement. Now since the two were good friends and Spain was willing to pay in cash money, the French obliged. But since they were still a little bitter about the recent Seven Years' War thing, they yeah. made sure to warn the Spanish not to let those dirty English on the other side of the island take over. So Spain went over to the English and explained, Pope, line on map, Spain's island. And the English said, yeah right, this is our island. But the Spanish had more guns so they kicked them off anyway. But then England threatened to go to war. So Spain went to their friends in France and said, Hey, it looks like stuff is about to go down. You in on this? And the French Minister of War said, Yeah, and we'll launch a full-scale invasion of England and party like it's 1066. But then King Louis XV said, One, you're insane, and two, you're fired. Sorry Spain, we're not ready for a war yeah. right now. So Spain had to give the English their settlement back, saying it's still our island. And the English said, No, it's our island. Then some colonists in North America got a bit rowdy, so the American English had to Revolution. leave their settlement to go focus on that. But they left behind a plaque that said this is totally still our island. So the island was in Spanish hands, but then a French guy, no not that one, that one, turned on the Spanish, took over most of the country, and captured King Ferdinand VII, and in response, the Spanish colonies in South America started vying for independence. Yeah, and so, well that's what happened, when Napoleon took power, um, he, he essentially deposed the Spanish king of his own throne, and um, imposed his own brother, I can't remember his brother's name at the minute, but he imposed his own brother's name, essentially king of Spain. Um, and this were to be a, a big thing, a huge, a uh, huge deal, because not only would the Spanish colonies abroad see this as an opportunity for independence, because particularly as well for the Spanish administrating uh, force there as well, it's a lot harder to keep control of your colonies when you're technically not in control of your own country. Um, and so that's why you saw the uh, independence movements happening in numerous uh, South American countries. Um, while this was happening. And then, of course, obviously you had uh, one of Napoleon's biggest mistakes as well was essentially doing that to Spain because it would lead to the Peninsula War and that would cause all manner of trouble um, for the French themselves. They would lose um, tens of thousands of men in a bloody and costly campaign that ultimately would only, again, hinder um, France's uh, ability to fight. Um, particularly during the coalitions um, against them. And so, yeah, well, it wasn't the best idea, but it, it shows that um, France invading Spain hundreds of years ago still led to repercussions that would ultimately actually almost lead up to the Falklands conflict, um, which is what we're about to see with... Um, Argentina, or pre-Argentina as it is here. So Spain had a little bit on its hands and also had to leave the islands. And for a couple decades, the islands were left uninhabited except for the penguins, some fishermen, and the gauchos, which are basically like cowboys but cooler and Spanisher. A merchant from Hamburg, living in the now independent United Provinces of the Rio de la Plata, heard about the feral cattle roaming the Falklands and thought it would be a good way to make some money. 
So he got permission from both Buenos Aires and the British government to set up trade there as a private venture. Some American ships came down and began hunting whales and seals around the islands, and Vernet wasn't too happy about it. So he asked Buenos Aires for some military assistance in defending the islands, but Buenos Aires said, meh, do it yourself gave him some weapons, and appointed him governor of the islands. So he seized the U.S. ships and arrested their crews. In response, two things happened. First, America came down and said, nice settlement you have there. Would be a shame if someone destroyed it. And then they destroyed it. Second, Britain heard Rene had been appointed governor, meaning the United Provinces, actually now the Argentine Confederation, were officially claiming the islands as theirs. So Britain showed up and said, hey, didn't you see our plaque? And since they had more guns, they kicked them off the island. And the Falklands remained firmly in British hands for the next century. They officially became a crown colony in 1840. Port Stanley became the island's capital in 1845. The cattle hides from the island weren't worth much, so they imported sheep from Britain in 1851. Two world wars came and went, and all this time, the Argentinians never rescinded their claim over the islands. Now it's 1976, and after a couple civil wars, a new brutal military dictatorship sponsored by the US fight against communism has taken control in Argentina. Yeah, so another military uh, junta. And that, that was kind of a hallmark of the Cold War. We were speaking about uh, moving on to the Cold War series. A co series of videos by Oversimplified. But that was kind of... Although the Cold War didn't actually turn into a hot war between the great powers, there were almost certainly proxy wars. Um, and these proxy wars were in part, or largely in some cer some circumstances, uh, orchestrated by various secret service agencies um, from both the Soviet Union and uh, and America, and well, the West as a whole, and particularly as well, South America was one of the playgrounds um, for this type of thing. Obviously, you had heavy Soviet influence in Cuba, and you know that would cause all manner of problems with the Cuban Missile Crisis and various things like that. And then, of course, you had um, the CIA propped up... Uh, the military junta here and at the time of the Falklands War it was Gautieri um, who was running things essentially a kind of almost a pseudo military dictator and then of course um, you had other places in South America like uh, Chile with um, General Pinochet uh, General Pinochet who um, again another CIA kind of western back who uh, toppled the legitimate government and uh, in place General Pinochet who managed to disappear thousands of his own people as well um, and so it's an important thing to know that uh, while the Cold War didn't actually escalate between wars between great powers there almost certainly was proxy wars being fought everywhere not just Vietnam or Korea but elsewhere um, and just because the great powers weren't necessarily involved in them doesn't mean that there wasn't some sort of uh, capability or culpability rather to the um, to the hostilities well, emerging from these types of countries. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm going on a ramble. But Cold War, proxy wars, various CIA and uh, KGB intelligence battles trying to basically play a game of chess with geopolitics um, and ideology. And by 1981, this guy was in power. The economy had been struggling for a long time, and Galtieri had been unable to improve the situation. Now, if you ever find yourself the brutal military leader of a struggling South American country, and you start getting into hot water, here's a bit of advice that has been tried and tested throughout the centuries. Start a war to distract everyone from their misery. Galtieri knew how popular he would be if he could finally take back Argentina's last Malvinas from the occupying British. There had been proposals to cut British military spending, and the ice patrol vessel HMS Endurance had been withdrawn from the area, so the Argentinians assumed the British may not even bother doing anything about the invasion. After easily capturing the largely uninhabited South Georgia Island, 600 Argentine troops were sent to the Falklands. The small number of Royal Marines and other British forces stationed there put up a small amount of resistance, but in the end had to surrender to the larger Argentine time force. Crowds in Argentina celebrated the news that they were wrong to assume the British would do nothing because the person in charge of the United Kingdom at the time was this lady. Thatcher was a somewhat controversial prime minister, but whether you loved her or hated her, there was no denying that she was tough, like metal. Iron, for example. Yeah, and so Thatcher in Britain is an extremely controversial subject, um, particularly the north of, uh, north of Britain. She is very much not popular. Um, due to various internal things um, that I don't know if necessarily all of you are interested in, but things like the miners' strike and um, kind of breaking the unions, heavy use of police, um, very not very popular up north either. And uh, eventually she was uh, ousted by um, poll tax, which was uh, vastly unpopular. But the irony is as well is um, through Argentina, 
launching the invasion of the Falklands in order to try and win popular support. Um, at the same time, Thatcher was not particularly popular herself, and so in a way, Argentina invading the Falklands was one of the best things that could have happened for Margaret Thatcher, in the sense that it was a direct attack on British soil, and that enabled her to kind of, again, rip up um, popular support. And so, in an almost ironic uh, way, the Argentines seeking to maybe nick the Falklands just to uh, boost their own popularity, ultimately also was just like, happened to be going up against a British leader who also needed to boost their own population. Uh, po population? Popularity. Um, and as well, it must be mentioned as well, before the war actually started, there were talks um, and serious talks about Argentina just simply buying the Falkland Islands. And that was something that was being considered for a long time, but the invasion completely put pay to that. Um, and yeah, I suppose with the Argentine economy going, that wouldn't have worked out well in the long run, but it almost certainly would have been a better option than military invasion, uh, particularly when uh, what's about to happen happened. And that is, it assembled a huge, well, Britain assembled a huge naval task force um, to sail south um, to the Falklands. You know, a, a lot of the ships were due to go on leave, a lot of the sailors were due to. Uh, to finish their kind of uh, tours or whatever the navy calls uh, tours of duty um and again from that book uh, forgotten voices of the falklands war a lot of the soldiers there uh, were a couple of days away like the old cliche a couple of ways uh, a couple of days away from their leave going and they were docked to gibraltar and then suddenly found themselves being rerouted all the way to the uh near on the Arctic Circle, or it might even be inside the Arctic Circle, uh, to a bunch of islands that a lot of them probably actually hadn't heard of before. Um, I believe at the time as well there was almost popular outrage that uh, some people within Britain uh, believed that the Falkland Islands were actually a collection of some of the islands off the coast of Scotland, to which case that must have been an interesting uh, illusion if they believed that, that Argentina had somehow invaded off the coast of Scotland. Um, but yeah, again, I'm rambling. She immediately declared an exclusion zone around the islands and organized for a task force of over 100 ships to set sail for the Falklands. The United Nations expressed concern at the Argentine invasion. All South American nations apart from Chile backed Argentina. And since the United States had propped up the Argentine dictatorship, Reagan went to Thatcher and said, could you maybe just let them have the islands? And Thatcher said no. Okay, here, have some weapons. Fighting a war over 8,000 miles from home was a logistical challenge for the British. They requisitioned civilian cruise ships and containers, and they used British-owned Ascension Island as a forward base. By the time they arrived at the Falklands in May, the Argentine forces had had time to entrench themselves. The first task for the British was to gain control of the seas, which they did easily. On the 2nd of May, a British submarine sank an Argentine cruiser. The sinking was controversial, as it occurred outside the British exclusion zone. It was also the largest loss of life in a single incident during the war. No, I just have to say this as well, because um, as well, it's a highly controversial issue. Uh, and the Belgrano as well, by means, it wasn't exactly an up-to-date ship either. Um, however, while it, the loss of life is tragic, the captain of the Belgrano himself uh, later said that he was a legitimate target and his vessel was a legitimate target and had roles been reversed, he would have ordered the firing on the Belgrano had he been uh, in the British position. You know, and... It's a complex issue because you're dealing with the loss of human beings. Um, and so it's just an important factor to try and remember that war isn't simple as good guys and bad guys, black and white. Um, there's all different manners of c colour and problems that, are all, uh, that arise from this. Um, and the sinking of the Belgrano is just another poignant example of that. It's, uh, it's a highly controversial topic. Um, but again, war war is a highly controversial topic in itself. Um, and so it's just something to remember as well uh, from this. But also, the UK fighting a war 8,000 miles from home, logistically that is an utter nightmare. Um, you know, you, you just need to think of the supply chains there. As I said, they requisitioned two civilian uh, ships as well, the Atlantic Conveyor and the SS Cambria. Uh, one of them, I believe, was turned into a hospital ship. Um, I think that was the SS Cambria, and the Atlantic conveyor was kind of turned into a lodging ship, a logistical ship, uh, carrying things, ferrying things to and fro. Um, and so, yeah, the fact that the British Navy had to requisition civilian tankers just to be able to uh, supply the logistics to the initial invasion, it, 
is no easy task. And it's, it's something that I think some people roll their eyes at and just go, oh, well, Britain versus Argentina. Of course, Britain was going to win. It's just like, well, 8,000 miles from home is an awful long way to fight. Um, and while this is kind of getting off the point of the video, it's, it is something, again, important to remember that this was the the limits that uh, the Thatcher government was willing to go to to ensure that the Falklands were reclaimed in British hands and not kind of fallen to Argentine hands. Um, and in response, the Argentine Navy withdrew from the islands. The next task for the British was to gain air superiority. While the Argentine Air Force controlled the skies, they were able to inflict considerable damage on the Royal Navy below. Days after the sinking of the General Belgrana, two Argentine Super Etendars carried out a raid on the HMS Sheffield and sank it with an Exocet missile. For weeks, the Argentine Thai Air Force would continue to carry out raids and inflict heavy casualties on the Royal Navy, with British Sea Harriers doing their best to take out as many of the Argentine aircraft as they could. While the battle in the skies raged on, San Carlos was chosen as the best landing site for the British ground forces. So just getting quickly uh, back onto that, the HMS Sheffield uh, being sunk with a Exocet missile. Um, and again, the Falklands kind of conflict as well was a menagerie of various ways that mistakes are made by people. So, for example, one of the problems with the HMS Sheffield um, was that, well, not just the HMS Sheffield, but for many of the British uh, naval vessels, they were victims of lack of funding. And so, for example, with the HMS Sheffield in particular, and later the uh, Glamouran, once it was hit, uh, the sailors' uniforms uh, due to costs of them was changed from cotton to nylon and the problem with that is and I apologize if you're squeamish here um, the problem is when nylon gets hot it melts and so when ships are hit and there's fire and there's explosions what it essentially ended up being was that a lot of the sailors uniforms actually melted into their skin and so when they was cutting the uniforms off them they was taking their skin with them and there's no doubt that countless British sailors died as a result of government cost cutting. Um, equally important to that, uh, a lot of the technology as well was faulty. Uh, sea Dart and Sea Wolf uh, on some of the ships, which was the ship's anti-air capabilities, uh, suddenly found themselves malfunctioning or not even working properly. And some of the ships didn't even actually have the correct ammunition in order to fire those. Again, uh, due to the rush nature of the operation and general cost cutting. Um, and again, it's all types of things like this. And the Sheffield itself, um, the sinking of the HMS Sheffield received uh, a large amount of criticism towards the commander of the British fleet, uh, particularly by the uh, Navy Air Arm and the Royal Air Force, who were there trying to protect the fleet from the uh, from the Argentine planes. In that, numerous commanders, uh, n numerous squadron leaders um, of the Sea Harriers were being ordered to fly far-ranging patrols, even all the way out to the east, where kind of the South Georgia Island was. That was initially took um, when lots of the pilots of the actual air arm and the RAF deemed that they should stay above the fleet in order to protect them from plane attacks. And it was during numerous of these patrols where Argentine aircraft would come and make their uh, attack runs. And Again, large criticism is laid at the commander of the fleet, whose again name eludes me, but I will um, try and fill out his name in the bottom, along with uh, any potential um, quotes and uh, footnotes that I am using um, throughout this video. And so, again, it's just a mess of things. And the same goes for the Argentines. Is um, A large number of the Argentine force on the island wasn't professional soldiers. A large number of them were conscripts, and particularly from their memoirs and their diary entries at the time while the conflict was going on, a lot of them did not want to be there. They did not actually want to be on the Falklands. They didn't wish to be fighting the British. And so you ended up with this weird situation where you had British sailors who many of them didn't actually know whereabouts the Falklands actually were, being drafted south to fight a land, uh, to fight people who also didn't actually want to be there, um, who were conscripted to be there. Um, and so it, the Falkland Islands was a mess, but it's incredibly interesting in a morbid type of way. Uh, this is, of course, the Pebble Island Raid, 
um, which we're about to cover now, which was a tiny stretch of, um, well, almost like um, a peninsula in itself, an archipelago, um, to get a foothold, a toehold, essentially. An SAS raid took out Argentine defenses on Pebble Island, and the HMS Alacrity sailed through Falklands Sound to flush out any Argentine supply ships. The landings began on May 21st, with Argentine aircraft carrying out full-scale raids on the task force ships taking part in the landing, damaging several and sinking a few. But anti-aircraft cannons and sea harriers shot down many of the aircraft in what became a major turning point for air superiority, and a beachhead was successfully formed. Then the ground troops began their movements out of San Carlos, across the north towards Stanley, and south toward the Argentine stronghold at Goose Green. In the following battles, a clear trend emerged. The Argentine conscripts put up a good fight, and with the rough muddy terrain, the war was by no means easy for the British, but with highly skilled Royal Marine commanders and parachute regiment troops, the British would often find themselves taking on larger numbers of Argentinian soldiers, but would still come out victorious with minimal casualties. The 14-hour long battle for Goose Green commenced on the night of May 28th. The battle ended in a decisive British victory, with over 900 Argentinians surrendering. Then, with 5,000 reinforcements arriving from the 5th Infantry Brigade, the British started preparing for their final assault on Stanley. In a series of fought battles, they took control of the hills and mountains surrounding the town, as the Argentine forces withdrew with British ships shelling their positions from offshore. Utterly surrounded, on the 14th of June, the Argentinians surrendered, and the war was over. So just getting back to that as well quickly, um, when the British actually made their initial landings, uh, a little interesting fact for you, um, one of the commanders, and I think it might have been of the commando units, um, was killed, and his replacement was on leave in Britain. And so when the commando was was killed, uh, they needed his replacement to come in. And uh, so this man in Britain, again, uh, later on after this video, I will try and uh, edit, if not when the video goes up, uh, after the video is up and uh, contain it in the description, uh, was informed of this. He had to be drafted to the Falklands. So he went to Westminster, received his briefing, got on a plane, flew to Ascension Island, and then when he was at Ascension Island and the plane was refueling, he was given an immersion suit and a parachute, and because he needed to take command pronto, essentially, he was flown from Ascension Island over the vague area of where the British task force was, and particularly the carrier group, and from there he jumped out of the plane uh, to land in the ocean to later be picked up by... Uh, one of the helicopters on the aircraft carriers, um, which I can only imagine was a very daunting prospect with the ascension, uh, with, with with the essential need to wear an immersion suit. Because remember, these are Arctic temperatures essentially, um, and hypothermia was a real danger. And so, imagine being on leave with your family, being told that you need to go eight thousand miles from home uh, because you know you you need to take command. And then be told on the way there that you are going to be jumping out of a plane into Arctic temperatures to be picked up to then lead a kind of war from the front. That would be uh, that'd be a little bit daunting to say the least. Um, but yeah, so the, the war was over. The uh, Stanley was was seized. Um, and yeah, it, it led to, again, still tremendous loss of life. Um, and having said through this as well, uh, civilians did die um, during this conflict, but on the whole, and again I must state this as well because it is very easy to go with the narrative that Argentina or the Argentine military are the bad guys, um, particularly you know from from my understanding. But it's important to remember that you know that they were regular people for the most part. Most people who fight in wars are regular people. And for the most part, the uh, Falkland Island civilians were not mistreated, were not malharmed um, by all accounts, all, all the accounts that I have read, um, and there wasn't really open hostility. In fact, I believe that one of the Falkland Islanders, once the initial occupation had happened, uh, had tried to fashion a homemade grenade and actually blown off his own uh, digits on his hand, and the Argentines actually gave him medical um, as a result of him trying to essentially create an IED uh, to use against them. And so, you know, it's something that needs to be important. It's war, that there is going to be collateral damage, and unfortunately, Falkland Islands was no different to that. Um, but for the most part as well, you know, civilians were 
trying to be kept out of the fighting from both sides and you know that you can't always say that about modern, modern conflicts or even old conflicts um so you know an almost happier note if there is if there is one from that the two month long war claimed hundreds of lives and left the islands strewn with minefields that still pose a problem to this day. Argentina still claims the islands, but in 2013 a referendum was held and the islanders voted 99.8% in favor of remaining British. Plus, oil was just found near the islands, so the British probably aren't going to give them up anytime soon. Yeah, and you know, and that's the that's the important thing to remember is um not not the oil necessarily, although that is certainly going to be a factor going forward. Uh, uh, what I said earlier about the Argentines potentially buying the islands, that is certainly out of the question now that oil has been found off the coast. But the important thing there, you know, and people just go, oh, was it worth it, uh, the Falkland War? And, you know, it's always a difficult thing to quantify a war because it ultimately means human suffering, human loss. Um, however, the referendum stating that overwhelmingly overwhelming support... Um, is in favour of remaining British, then that has to account and stand for something. Because at the end of the day, despite being such a small island, a small population, you know, does that negate kind of their their rights to kind of self dependency or who they who they choose to be ruled by? Um, you know, it's a debate. It's a debate question. You know, whether the lives and the casualties of those from both Argentina and Britain. Uh, kind of were weighed up by the small population on the Falkland Islands and you know that, that's a whole another debate entirely you know I, I'm not here necessarily to tell you what to think or what not to think um, in fact if you have a view of that then uh, say in the description uh, in the comments below rather um, but I think it's definitely a poignant note that um, just because a population is small doesn't necessarily mean that they don't matter um, and, you know, if the recent polls say anything, that it'll be a long time before the Falkland Islands legally uh, change from being anything other than a uh, crown dependency. But I think that might be the end of the video. Yes, it is. Um, so thank you for watching. Uh, hope you've enjoyed. Hope I've been able to fill in some of the blanks. Uh, as I said, either when this video goes live or after it's been live, I'll come back and edit the description to try and... Uh, remember the names of the individuals that I've included and the direct quotes from them um, that I've found. So if you are interested, you can actually do your own research on this matter and read about more because it is an interesting conflict. It is, well, all conflict is interesting to learn about, um, but it's always nice to have views that isn't, that, yeah, it's always nice to have views that aren't just based on, say, British voices or Argentine voices or civilians or war correspondents who were never there. Um, it's nice to have a balanced view of all of those voices. Um, you know, some of those views uh, are in direct conflict with each other. Others, uh, surprisingly, despite being under flags of different countries, are quite similar. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'd strongly recommend checking it out, doing your own research. And um, without further ado, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.